button is on. We'll get tuned up here as, in a second. Um, we're in um, Malachi, the uh, second chapter, and we're going to look at uh, verses uh, 10 through 16. Um, yeah, you guys... Okay. <laughs> I can speak loudly, but I'm sure for some folks that's uh, not adequate. <laughs> uh, be good? I'll pull it up some more. Okay. Is that better? 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 It's on toward the toward the uh, wire, so that's off. This is on. Switch toward the wire is on. Is other? Wonder if they're separate. As I said, Malachi 2 is where we're at, um, so let's go ahead and begin with a prayer, and uh, then I'll have a, a few introductory remarks, and we will, we will uh, go into the text. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this uh, time that we have to come together and assemble to uh, consider your word, to hear uh, from you uh, guidance and wisdom for our lives. We ask that you would um, open our hearts, that we would receive it humbly, and that we would live it out to your glory in all that we do. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. So this section, of course, is well known for um, the discussion about foreign wives and divorce. Um, I'm going to use that as sort of a, a jumping off point to go back to Genesis and talk about male-female marriage in general and then come forward into our time and some of the challenges we face, which are a bit broader than just foreign gods and divorce, um, as I think everyone's aware. I would like this to be something that is, uh, you know, truth and love, so there's a positive aspect and there's a negative aspect. But I do think that, that we as Christians really need to be um, more confident and yet obviously very humble in our um, defense of living out of God's truth in our lives uh, as, as it's uh, presented in creation as male and female. So you'll see some of those themes running through here. <clears throat> so let me go to the overview here. Um, we've seen in Malachi sort of, uh, as we talked about beginning in the first uh, couple of verses, um, you know, verse 1, I have loved you, says the Lord. We've seen this living out of God's love and how it's lived out horizontally. Um, of course, God's love is lived out vertically in terms of his care for us. We talked about that the first week. But the horizontal aspect in terms of the priests and their uh, role within the Jewish uh, nation and then, of course, uh, how it's lived out um, horizontally uh, in marriage this week. Um, specifically, there's a covenantal aspect we'll, we'll talk about here a little bit with God's unity that he's created. There's, there's a religious unity, and then there's a marital unity that's been broken that is being discussed. And then I'm going to go back to Genesis and talk about sort of the universal themes here of creation, fall, redemption, and how, what aspects we see unity and what aspects we see diversity in creation, in fall, in fall and in redemption. Um, I think losing sight of those basics um, leads to a lot of confusion, uh, even among Christians, if they're not careful. And then I want to look at our current time a little bit. Obviously, we could spend a lot of time talking about the confusions of today, and I really don't want to do that, but I do feel obliged to at least point out a few basics, and then kind of close with a, a, a note on sort of, yes, this is a challenge, but yes, it's an opportunity um, to show 
God's creation and its goodness, its truth, and its beauty in our lives. So let's go to the text and start going through um, chapter 2. Beginning in verse 10, Have we not all one Father? Did not one God create us? Why do we profane the covenant of our fathers by, by breaking faith with one another? Now, I think there's probably a pretty good case to be made <clears throat> that this links back to the previous verse that we didn't talk about really last week about showing partiality in, more, in matters of the law. So there was a um, profaning of the covenant, breaking faith with one another related to fraud and stealing and, and those sorts of breaking of the law that um, was common among the Jewish nation, um, particularly prior to captivity. But it's also a theme that's picked up here in verse 11. Um, and this unity in the covenant with God, I think, is, um, is sort of the, the key aspect. It's not that you could say, well, there's these laws, you've broken these laws. But I think what's important to note here is this is being grounded in the relationship with God. And I guess my question would be, why is that important? Why ground it? Why is it important to ground this there? It is a point of unity, that's for sure. And, that, and we'll talk about that repeatedly. I think it's critical because what's your alternative? If you toss God out, what have you got? Well, yeah, we'll talk a little about survival of the fittest when we get there. But from a, to, today, even in Christian circles, I, I'll hear this a lot of times in classes. Um, there's a kind of moralism that emerges. And, of course, a, you know, a lot of us who grew up in Bible Belt type environments with you know, going to church uh, three times a week at least, um, and perhaps we didn't really hear that vertical aspect. We heard more of the law aspect. Um, and, and that is not an adequate foundation. Some kind of moralism. Uh, obviously, Christianity has morals because God's law is God's law. But leaving it just sitting in midair without being grounded on a relationship with God, who God is, who we are, what our relationship is to him, leaves it on an inadequate foundation. And it's not one that's going to, to enslave people to righteousness. It will enslave them ultimately probably to sin. So I think that it's important to emphasize, although we won't spend much time on it, that the opening to this I think is really critical. Have we not all one Father? Did not one God create us? Why do we profane the covenant of our fathers by breaking faith with those around us? I'm reminded of David and Bathsheba, you know, against thee only have I sinned. I mean, this, this is a theme that... We kind of know, I think, at some level, but I'm not sure if it gets into our bones the way it ought to all the time. And I, I, I think that's probably certainly true of me. So I want to emphasize that <clears throat> as sort of an intro when we walking into this. Um, any comments on that? Okay. 11 and 12. So the foreign gods. Judah has broken faith. A detestable thing has been committed in Israel and in Jerusalem. Judah has desecrated the sanctuary the Lord loves by marrying the daughter of a foreign god. As for the man who does this, <clears throat> whoever he may be, may the Lord cut him off from the tents of Jacob, even though he brings offerings to the Lord Almighty. So, on the surface, this seems pretty straightforward. And we could go back into Ezra, Nehemiah. I've got the scriptures noted there. This is, you know, in that time frame where they're dealing with that issue. And uh, we could go look at these verses in the interest of time. I'm not going to do that. But I would go back, I want to go back and talk a little bit about the foreign God aspect that is mentioned in Leviticus 18. So this is a, to me, this is a touchstone chapter when you start talking about biblical sexual morality, particularly when you talk about it for non-Christians. <clears throat> So 
the, the chapter is a list of uh, prohibitions that in general begin with do not have sexual relations, yada, yada, yada. So there are prohibitions on sexual uh, behavior in general. There's a couple of exceptions we could talk about as to why they're there, particularly <laughs> offering children to idols. But um, <clears throat> in general, it's prohibited sexual relations. Okay, that's fine as far as it goes. The Jews have these prohibitions. They're God's people. But beginning in verse 24, do not defile yourselves in any of these ways, because this is how the nations that I am going to drive out before you became defiled. Even the land was defiled, so I punished it for its sin, and the land vomited out its inhabitants. But you must keep my decrees and my laws. The native born and the aliens living among you must not do any of these things. So these are not the people who are a part of the covenant people, but they're living in the land. For all these things were done by the people who lived in the land before you, and the land became defiled. And if you defile the land, it will vomit you out as it vomited out the nations that were before me. So... What this says is these folks who didn't have a clue who God was were nevertheless held liable for these types of behavior, a type of behavior, right? So there is a, there's a law written on the heart referred to here that I think is, is pretty critical. Folks know, we're back to Romans 1 again as we talked about before, <clears throat> there are certain things folks know uh, God and who he is, uh, his, the honor that's and respect that's, uh, and that's owed him, thanks that's owed him. But um, they suppress that, we suppress that in unrighteousness. And this right here is a part of what's written on the heart, evidently, because God is holding them to justice on this. And you remember, you know, there's a reference back um, the time of uh, Jacob where, uh, you know, the sin of the Amorites is not yet complete. It's going to be 400 years because these guys have not reached the point where they're going to be judged and held liable. Um, we didn't really talk about this um, week before last, but Jonah is another example. Jonah doesn't show up and say, here's an offer of redemption. It's a, no, here's a warning of destruction. That's it. You're, you're going to be, who are these people? They're not God's people. You're going to be destroyed. Um, so they repent and gives them a hundred plus year reprieve before they finally are overthrown by the Babylonians. Um, so there is, there's an aspect of this that's written on the heart is my point, and that is universal for all people, all places, all times, and they know it because it's in creation. Deuteronomy 7 um, is one other aspect of this. Let me go ahead and read this because I think this one's a good, a good comment on it also. Verses 3 and 4. Do not intermarry with them. Do not give your daughters to their sons or take their daughters for your sons, for they will turn your sons away from following me to serve other gods. And the Lord's anger will burn against you and will quickly destroy you. So this is the, a key aspect of this foreign god. You know, where there, There's just a fundamental division here where if you head down this road, you're in rebellion against God in this area of family, of, of uh, husband, wife, children, transmission of, of uh, the faith, the Jewish faith in this uh, instance. Um, so that's, um, that's the warning there. And I think you know, it's something that, as we see here at the end of the Old Testament, looking back uh, 1,500 years or so, has been out there for uh, a long time. As warnings to, as a theme of them not to not to intermarry with these foreign people. Okay, um, and and again, application. We could talk a lot about that in terms of unequally yoked, etc. I think most folks are familiar with that. I'm not going to go into that today in the interest of time. Um, Two fifteen. This one we don't talk about much. Has not the Lord made them one in flesh and spirit? They are his. And why one? Because he was seeking godly offspring. So guard yourself in your spirit and do not break faith with the wife of your youth. What is the purpose of all this? I mean, I, it, he's seeking godly offspring. Now, is the emphasis on offspring or godly? 
Yeah, I, th I think it's a false dichotomy. I'd, I'd agree it's probably both. I suspect in the context there's a little bit more emphasis on godly because as we'll talk about later, offspring are sort of assumed, um, which is no longer the case today um, for reasons we'll get into. But um, there's definitely both. And again, this goes back to creation, which we'll, we'll go hit in a minute. Um, and then, of course, the, the positive affirmation of guard yourself in your spirit. Do not break faith with the wife of your youth. An implication there that this is something that's going to be a challenge. Um, you know, this is what God's plan was, but you are going to be challenged in that. And we'll talk a little bit about that when we go back to Genesis 3. <clears throat> but um, do not break faith with the wife of your youth. Are there other wives? Is this just the wife of the youth? I, we don't have time to talk about polygamy, but it is in the Old Testament. It's not condemned as, say, adultery is, but the message, both in terms of narratives and specific discussions, is, is basically negative. This is not a good thing. And of course, it's not in creation, as we'll get to in a minute. But um, it seems like divorce, that it was kind of tolerated because of the hardness of their hearts for a time. I, I don't know what else to say about it, except I note it because it's coming back big time. And with the sexual chaos in our culture right now, I don't think it's very long before we see various forms of Polygamy, if you want to say it's a mixture of male and females, or polandry or polygyny, depending on whether it's uh, multiple husbands or multiple wives. But um, anyway, I, I do think that there's a distinct possibility we'll see people who claim to be Christian start to push this again um, because, uh, you know, it's kind of attempt to sort of syncretize with where the culture's going. But I'll just, I'll just mention that in passing and move on. Um, and then um, 2.16, I hate divorce, says the Lord, God of Israel, and I hate a man's covering himself with violence as well as with his garment, says the Lord Almighty. So guard yourself in your spirit and do not break faith. Again, a repetition of this. This is, a, this is something that is a challenge that is going to have to be faced and is going to have to be pursued and is going to have to be obeyed. Um, so I hate a man's covering himself with violence as with a garment is with his garment. Um, what's, what's that about? I mean, we get the I hate divorce. I'm, I, again, I don't have any definitive answer on this, but I do think it's worth thinking about. Um, is there a violence associated with uh, divorce? And I'm not talking, I'm not talking metaphorically here now, I'm not talking physically. I, obviously physical violence is condemned. I mean, that's, that's just a basic fact. But I do think that there is uh, a, a, a violence here that is uh, emotional, that's economic, et cetera, that's associated with divorce, particularly in that time and place where um, you basically were, if, if the woman had a family, maybe she could go back to them or maybe not. But um, she's really put at risk, um, very vulnerable. Um, so I think a part of the reason that God's linking this, this is just my opinion, uh, is, as I say, divorce was tolerated because of the hardness of their hearts. And this is an emphasizing look. This is not something that is, is really um, in God's plan. It's not the way he, he created things. So... Any comments on that passage before we go back to Genesis? Because we're going to run through Genesis pretty fast, too. Yes? Yes. Yeah, godly offspring are really not possible without an intact marriage. I mean, I don't say not possible. I mean, it's just very, it's much, much more difficult. It's not what God created. Obviously, there are 
people who are left with uh, single parents for whatever reason, death, abandonment, whatever, that, that do great jobs. But that's not the creation. Um, it's not what God intended. Okay, let's go to Genesis. Um, let me flip to the next slide here. <clears throat> Thanks. For some reason that's not not flipping. I guess I should have put that on my belt. Okay. Creation. Um, just real quick here to sort of line this out. There is both unity and diversity in creation. So we can go back and read Genesis 1, 2, and 3, but you guys know the verses as well as I do. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Um, you know, they are, there is a unity there in terms of image of God, and there is a unity in terms of marriage. Um, there's a unity in terms of children. You have to have both to get children. There is a unity in the dominion decree to exercise dominion, so they multiply and, and exercise dominion. All these things are sort of unity aspects of creation that exist there. And yet there is a diversity, <clears throat> and that diversity is seen very fundamentally in males different from female, females different from male. Um, and that is, is an obvious um, difference that um, is, is always there. One of the challenges we have today is how do you defend that? I mean, how do you, how do you state that in a way that, um, you know, is truth and love? I, again, at some level, I'm tempted to say, look, you know, if you can't tell XXXY apart and you can't see the obvious physical differences that, you know, exhibit, um, um, that are there exhibited, I, I don't have anything else to say. It is in creation. It's very fundamental. Um, but um, it is certainly under attack today. In the fall, um, we have a unity in, in our sinfulness. All of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. One thing that I've never heard anybody talk about, and I'm certainly not going to try to exposit this right now, but there is a diversity in the curse. Um, Adam didn't get the same curse as Eve. Eve didn't get the same curse as Adam. What is Adam's curse about? He'll have to work hard, and why would he be given that curse? Speculation now. Yeah, he's, again, for physical reasons in a hunter-gatherer society or an agricultural society, he's probably going to be out there, um, you know, working or a nomadic society with uh, sheep and so on. Um, and the wife will be the helper. Again, that's what we see in creation is there's a helper role. That's Eve. It's not good to be alone, a helper and so on. Um, and Eve's curse, what does it relate to? Childbearing. Now, are these curses sin? No, they're the result of sin. We live in a fallen world. If you don't work, you don't eat. Ideally, you know, I mean, at some level, there's this, this, this uh, mandate that you're going to have to work. It's going to be tough. Uh, if you're if you're going to give birth to a child, are you going to escape the pain? Well, I mean, even a C-section, I guess, might have its own aspects of pain and recovery. So, um, I don't think these are sins; they're the result of sin. But the other two curses that are there for Eve. I'm not going to try to explain these. I'm just going to say you ought to think about them. Your desire will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. That, to me, fundamentally, whatever that means, is saying there's a breach in the relationship. The unity that is in creation has been, uh, there's thorns growing in it now. And that's just part of, of the fall, which means that um, as husbands and as wives, we're going to face some real challenges here, just like we face challenge in um, 
tilling the soil metaphorically or giving childbirth literally. Um, those things are there, they are pervasive, they are as obvious and as fundamental and as painful as the previous two items. And, and again, obviously, this desire, um, if it, I mean, my, my interpretation is this is, a, this is a usurping of the helper leadership um, role structure. That would be my interpretation of it. But um, that sort of thing can obviously become sinful. Um, and obviously, the rule over you, uh, that also can become sinful. But I don't think inherently what's here is, is sinful. I've never heard that discussed. I'm just throwing that out there and saying that these Genesis 1, 2, and 3 is the fundamentals. Everybody lives with this. It's been there from the beginning. It'll be there until Christ returns and we're recreated in a new heavens, new earth, and new bodies. Uh, it's, it's just the way it is. Um, so understanding that, I think, is important. Um, and then there is, um, in redemption, unity, as I've got up here, Galatians 3, Colossians 3, these different categories that are mentioned there, um, you know, we're one in Christ despite being Jew, Greek, slave, free, male, female, circumcised or not, barbarian, Scythian is a type of barbarian or not, slave three. Um, there's a unity in Christ um, that Paul's referring to there, and yet there's a diversity, and there's various scriptures we could go to to talk about diversity of roles within the body, um, and some of those have a male-female aspect to them, and again, I'm not going to dive into this. So, any comments on this from a creation Genesis 1, 2, 3 perspective? Gives me about 15 minutes to go through where we are today and wrap up. Okay. So, how is this viewed today? I'm, let me just say this. I don't have this in the notes, so I'm going to say this somewhere, and I'll just say it here before I forget it. Um, I'll hit a little bit on second wave feminism later on, but uh, beginning in the 60s, 70s, 80s, you, you began to see the influence of second wave feminism. And by the late 80s, there was a real uh, robust discussion among Protestants about male-female. And you had the Danvers statement on sort of the conservative side, and then in reaction to that, you had a group um, that call themselves Christians for Biblical Equality, CBE International is their website. Um, and the Danvers Statement was sort of associated with a group that's now called CBMW, Christians for Biblical Manhood and Womanhood. Um, if you're interested in sort of all the details of this stuff from a theological point of view, I think Wayne Grudem's book on this, which is free on the CBMW website, 400 pages or so, is, is the best thing I've ever seen. And I think it fairly represents the arguments for the, uh, what are called egalitarian types who would say there's no distinctive male-female roles um, and, and the complementarian types, which I think most of us probably are, we wouldn't be here, uh, which think there are distinctive male-female roles in the family and in the church. So I'll just say that as sort of a, um, a reference point if you're interested in something that's more in depth. So trends. If you'll move that, if you'll page forward for me there. Um, this top thing, if this doesn't connect with you, please ignore it. Some people will probably like this, and some people will go, I don't have a clue what you're talking about. You're just making me frustrated. Um, so I'm sort of riffing off of Francis Schaeffer's Truth with a Capital T. So Francis Schaeffer was a, a Swiss... Um, cultural apologist, kind of a C.S. Lewis kind of guy in the late latter half of the 20th century. And he would talk about truth with a capital T, and he's talking about versus a lowercase t. So there's, a, there's universal truth, it's God's truth, but we live in a culture that's denied there's any universal objective truth. That's what he was talking about. I've extended that and probably confused it at some level, but <clears throat> I'm really saying that the T in the truth, which is what Schaefer was pointing to, is, is sort of the universal, vertical, transcendent source for truth. Do you have a capital T truth? If you do, then you have some transcendent vertical source for that truth. 
if you have a lowercase t truth, then it's a diverse source for truth. It's just kind of, well, everybody's got their own truth sort of thing, which is the culture we live in. So that's kind of the top row there where God disappears. And we talked about that in the first lecture as we move from, you know, the modern, the birth of the modern era, and then as Christianity was displaced, and then postmodernism. Um, and then the bottom line, that's the, the second row there where I say liberty disappears. That one is, is a lot more, I think, sketchy in terms of just tossing something on the table. But pre-modern, you had a monarch, and the monarch ruled. There was capital T truth, ruled with the mandate of heaven, or something like that, if you want to go into Asian cultures. Um, and the cultures tend to be fairly monolithic. And again, I think of Japan, you know, the nail that sticks up gets hammered down. Uh, very monolithic type cultures. But in all pre-modern tribal type cultures, you have that sort of, of aspect to them. The real distinctive thing that happened in the West, based on Greek philosophy to a certain degree, certainly based on Christianity, was you had capital T truth, but you had diversity as it was lived out horizontally. And that's seen most clearly in the uh, Declaration of Independence, Constitution, that's a very clear message there, I think, that you know, e pluribus unum, you can get that. Um, and you can argue, I'll contend you can't have that without its Christian roots, but you can argue that. Postmodern said, no, that capital T is gone. So we're back into sort of just all these diverse things. Everybody you know, can have their own truth. Today, as we've shifted to kind of an identity uh, focus in the culture, what I, this, this is the part that kind of keyed me on this. What I'm seeing is there's no vertical capital T truth, but horizontally there's these tribal capital R-U-T-H, you know, very authoritarian kind of lived out uh, based on identity truths that are imposed. Um, and you're kind of back to a pre-modern thing in terms of authoritarian type culture, but without the vertical root for it, anchor for it, so it's kind of nebulous, chaotic, and you can see that starting in the French Revolution, the Russian Revolution, etc. So anyway, enough on that. Um, if that helps you, fine. If it doesn't, don't worry about it. Secular extremes on male-female referred to earlier evolutionary. There's no image of God in unity here. We're just molecules in motion. This is an accident. There's no meaning to being human or not human. There's no difference between um, you know, the gases that are floating around in outer space and you as an organized set of molecules that, that's a, a human being. No difference. Um, you see that with the eugenics movement beginning in the late 1800s um, and sort of uh, that aspect through the early 1900s, um, which is now in the culture looked down on. Um, anybody who had an image of God understanding would have never accepted it. But you also see it in the male-female arena with claims of male superiority or female superiority. Um, I think of, and I'm sure most people don't, but some of the, um, some of the writings that are sort of quasi-historical kind of things out of second wave feminism have some very interesting takes on uh, you know, an ancient history where females were superior. But the point is, there's no image of God unity in this. This is setting male against female. That's the point. Um, <clears throat> identity, you know, the other secular extreme is, well, they don't exist. Male-female is, is, is sort of a, a social construct, and that's it. And biology, well, it's kind of incidental, and it's malleable, and boy, once we get in there and can do real genetic engineering, if I identify as a badger, then I can, you know, put some badger DNA in me and eventually, you know, be part badger. Um, that's where some of these folks are going. So. Those are the extremes, obviously. Both of those conflict with um, creation. Okay, next slide, if you don't mind rolling that up for me. Um, I'm not gonna talk about legal at all. This, you could talk about a ton of stuff on this. Um, but to me, politics is a caboose of a society or a culture. Politics obviously has a large influence, but by the time you see something prominent in a political arena, uh, the engine of the culture has long pulled it into the political arena. So it's, it's more the caboose than it is the engine, in my opinion. But there is a real shift here that we're dealing with today as Christians in this environment, <clears throat> and that is from a view of rights that are fixed because they're from the Creator, and you can see that in the Declaration, 
uh, for our country, and they're pre-political. They're, 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 they're before there's a government or politics. And of course, over the past 100 years or so, that's sort of disappeared as God's disappeared. And now we have fluid rights that are really fundamentally grounded in the government granting them or not granting them. And of course, right now we see a whole new wave of LGBTQ plus rights that are attacking what we would probably be most concerned about, First Amendment rights, uh, freedom of religion, uh, expression, the press, assembly, especially for formative purposes, because we assemble here for formative purposes. We have a freedom of assembly there. People establish Christian schools for formative purposes, uh, not just associative purposes. Um, so there's, uh, there's that shift that we're facing today that's an ongoing one. I'll mention this here because there's probably not a better place to mention it. If you're interested in hearing what's going on in this area in a biblical response to it, um, there's, a, there's a week, every weekday there is a podcast by the guy who's the president of the Southern Baptist uh, Theological Seminary, a guy named Al Mohler, and he does a real good job, I think, generally speaking. of All, all of his stuff is what's in the New York Times, what's in the Financial Times, um, what's in um, Time, what's in the Washington Post, what's in the San Francisco Chronicle, and things that are clearly in rebellion against God, and then a Christian worldview of, of that sort of thing. This past week, he talked a lot about these Genesis 1, 2, 3 things in his uh, podcast. Um, so if you're interested in that sort of thing, I'd, I'd point you to him. Um, ideas, fixed truth versus uh, fluid, fragmented truth. We've kind of talked about that already. I'll say again, Carl Truman's Rise and, and uh, Triumph of the Modern Self is, is the book on this topic. Um, I don't, there's, I've not run across anything like it. Um, I'm a big fan of Schaefer for those people who, are, who understand Schaefer. Um, um, and there's other folks that, that I think have done good work. But his, his, his discussion, we talked about this a little bit the first week, of uh, Rousseau really shifted I mean, we talked about how God disappeared in the Enlightenment, the Renaissance and the Enlightenment, and there was a focus on the human as a source of knowledge, and that was a rational focus. We could, through reason, empiricism, et cetera, we could understand everything. And then with Rousseau, it really shifted to experience. So from the mind to sort of the emotions, and, uh, <clears throat> and Rousseau was really focused on that. That's where we get the therapeutic impulse that we live with today, et cetera. Freud picked up on that and said, well, all of this experience, it's fundamentally grounded in sex. And by sex, I mean sex, uh, behavior. And um, that's, that's everything's explained by sexual desire, everything. But you've got to suppress it. If you don't suppress it, it causes chaos. So you can't have civilization without the suppression of this fundamental foundational thing. And then Reich and Marcuse came along and said, it's really bad to suppress sexual desire. And the reason is the suppression of sexual desire is something that creates a family that's stable, that has authority in it. And what does authority lead to in the family? If you're in 1930, 1940 in Germany, what does authority lead to in the family? It leads to Hitler, it leads to Lenin, it leads to Stalin, it leads to abuses by authority. So if you're going to keep these authoritarians from getting in charge, you've got to destroy the family. Now, Marx and Engels talked about that a little bit back in the mid-1800s uh, with, uh, you know, the start of Marxism. But these guys kind of supercharged it. If you're interested in that story, Truman's book is, is really good on that. Uh, Simone de Beauvoir, second wave feminism, arguably she's a more important philosopher than Sartre, her, her longtime partner. Uh, he's better known, but um, she really, again, there's a, there's a split there. We don't need, male, female don't need each other. There's, this, is, this is bad to have this male-female unity. So there's a real attack there on that. The Lambeth Congress I mentioned because prior to 1930, nobody in the Protestant or the Catholic world, nobody in the, broad, the broadest terms, Christian world, thought contraception was not sinful. Um, the Lambeth Conference, after earlier attempts, the, I won't go into what a La the Lambeth Conference is, but there, every 10 years there's Anglican conferences since the mid-1800s. They, they put out the first positive statement on contraception. And of course, that's not something we talk much about, um, but we're back to that multiply aspect of Genesis. So we'll, we'll touch that in a second. Uh, technology, <clears throat> there's some real constraints that have faded here. Um, wealth, you know, uh, 
we're into exponential growth of wealth. You look post 1850 per capita income in the West, it's just exploded. Uh, what we have relative to our parents or grandparents is just astonishing. And if you if you're very old, you see this pretty clearly. Um, so what does that mean? That means we don't have to worry as much about these constraints that nature put on us to have these male-female roles. Those, those constraints kind of disappear. Work is now much less physical. Used to with agricultural, there's a premium on you know, just sheer body strength, males being bigger and stronger. Certainly true in the Industrial Revolution um, to a large degree, but now that we're in an information age, um, and everything's about knowledge. The work shifts to being mind work instead of body work. Um, those differences have, have faded. And in many cases, females arguably are, are better in some way. So um, there's that shift. And then the biology aspect we talked about earlier. The biggest one here with birth control, <coughs> contraception, that kind of thing, sex has been separated from reproduction. That is just hugely important. And it's... It, it's pervasive across the world. And it's really been separated uh, from gender, as we talked about earlier with people who say, I'm a male and a female's body or vice versa. So it's malleable. Okay, next slide. <clears throat> Just say a real quick thing about <clears throat> um, uh, sort of, you know, what's happened on, in terms of effects. Marriage has disappeared. Average age at which people get married has is, is dramatically increased and this sort of distinction between male and female has disappeared in many ways. Um, what happens as a result of that? Well, as alluded to earlier, this oneness that's in creation fades. So the oneness, it's a unity in the spouses uh, between a husband and a wife, uh, between parents and children. All these things suffer, um, and we don't need to elaborate on that. I think it's quite visible. In the long run, you have a severe erosion of social capital. Um, and we see this in, in areas where um, you know, divorce is prominent, uh, parents don't have two, or children don't have two parents, et cetera. There's, there's uh, severe impacts that cause all kinds of problems. Um, you know, the socialization of young males is something that every society, if they fail at it, is it really at risk. Um, and then demographics, I put this in here for two reasons. The diagram on the left is uh, showing fertility rate since uh, 1960, and there's various nations there, but the bottom line is everybody's dropping. Used to, people thought this was a first world thing because they have contraception, the third world doesn't. But now it's, no, it's, it's everywhere, and it's an urban thing anywhere. I don't care if it's first, second, third world. It's all places have declining birth rates. Um, and fertility rates. And part of the reason, you know, fertility rates were high, say, 300 years ago, was infant mortality was really high. You know, kids didn't survive to adulthood. A lot of kids didn't. So you had to have a lot of kids. But <clears throat> on the right-hand side, uh, probably not real visible population growth, um, 1,700 to 2,100. And the line that spikes up and then drops down is the annual growth rate. So that's the rate of growth. And it has just plummeted since 1965. And this is worldwide. So there's been this multiplication that was sort of sparked by the Industrial Revolution, the wealth, the, the decline in infant mortality, et cetera. But um, in the wake of all that, again, now people are just not getting married, not having kids. OK, <clears throat> so a couple of, if you want to flip to the next slide, and I'll, I'll hit, um, I'll hit two, final, two final things here real quickly. Um, so the shift to knowledge, work, and wealth means people tend to delay marriage and children, um, and yet we're, we're still faced with creation. It's not good to be alone. Multiply and fill the earth. Um, and if you're a young person today, I think this is a really tough issue to face. I mean, we've talked to with our kids some about it. Um, they certainly have faced it, and I could tell stories there, but you don't have time. But you know, for a lot of people my age, when we were growing up, you didn't really think much about it. Everybody got married, had kids. You know, it wasn't really thought that much about. So this is a massive shift that, that needs to be faced. And then, of course, this explosion of expressive individualism kind of being sort of the core of what it means to be human. Um, oneness, sacrificial oneness in a marriage, 
becoming one, raising godly children, this covenantal as this covenant that we have that has these vertical and horizontal aspects. This this becomes very foreign in our culture. So I'll just mention that in passing and say those are two, I think, of the of the key challenges that we sort of face living a Christian life in a culture that's rejected some of these basics. And last slide. Um, so where do we leave this? I think that we need really a humble confidence in, in God and his creation here, that it is a good and true and beautiful thing, um, not defensive, not syncretistic, where we're kind of compromising on what's there, but really a, a great deal of confidence in the unity that God's created, um, which is we are in his image. Uh, we're one in a marriage. We have a unity as God have mercy on me, a sinner, at the foot of the cross, we have a unity if we're members of Christ's body and salvation, and yet we're also confident in the goodness of the diversity that God has created, that there's goodness in male and there's goodness in female. There's a goodness in filling the earth, multiplying and filling the earth. There's a goodness in family and raising godly children. Um, so anyway, that's a quick run through um, Malachi 2 and sort of the, the implications from it. Comments, questions, Ed? Well, some of this, uh, particularly if you spend a lot of time in the scripture, would not have any real clue. But that's the way things are going. People accept their faith in this God, and there's a lot of detail in the Word of God and a lot of things that can happen. But uh, we still have. I think that, that, again, light is brightest in the darkest and in the darkness, and I think that eventually as the um, fruit of a lot of this rebellion you know, becomes apparent, that Christians may be the only people that are really extending a gracious hand of calling people to repentance and forgiveness and, and, and salvation. Um, because if it turns out badly, I mean, I can see a scenario where suddenly a lot of this is sort of turned on and very violently, and, um, and that would not be a good thing. Um, but Christians might turn out to be a refuge for folks who've been in rebellion at some point. That we already are, but the church is, God is. But anyway, other comments, questions? Okay, next week we are going to, pardon? Al Mohler, <clears throat> The Briefing. If you do a search on the internet for Al Mohler, The Briefing, you will find it. I grew up listening to Paul Harvey, you know, particularly at noon, 15 minutes. To me, Mohler is like Paul Harvey, except from a Christian worldview. <laughs> um, so for, for people of a certain age, you may be able to relate to that. Um, there's a ton of stuff out there. I mean, the good thing about the internet is now you can you can it's easy to go out and find a lot of different perspectives and find people who have a good orthodox view who have some really interesting things to say about this. But unless you're interested in tracking a lot of this stuff, most people would just kind of be, you know, no, no, I, I got a real life to live. <laughs> okay, next week. Amen. Amen. I think that is a, an extremely wise word, and as I said before, that's why the first week, that's why 1 Corinthians 1 and 2, to me, is sort of foundational. 
This is where Christians live. They live in God's word. They live in the cross. They, they live there. That's where they live. Um, how to be wise as serpent and harmless as doves. Again, how to provide a defense for what you believe in. Uh, I agree. I think there's, for those of you who haven't, well, I guess I won't say that. Somebody who's focused primarily on apologetics and primarily on this is what's wrong with X, Y, and Z, I'm not saying there's not some value in that, but I think that's a very dangerous place to be. You need to be very, very careful about that because you can look at people who've been down that road and have drifted away from God because they weren't focused on this. And I agree completely with what you said. I appreciate you saying that. It's a good, good word to end on. Okay, next week we'll cover the rest of Malachi. Um, I'll go over it, obviously, a bit more quickly. Um, but there's some interesting things in there that if you haven't read it before, um, I think you'll be intrigued by. Thanks for your comments.